Hello, everyone. My name is Rick Hawkins. I'm the pastor of Quest Church. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. You're about to hear a word that is informative, insightful, and inspirational. If you'd like to support our ministry, you can go to questchurch.com. Enjoy the message. God is good. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. I'll have you stand for the reading of God's word. My wife and I had a wonderful journey last night to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to be at the Transformation Conference with Michael Todd, and, and it was just an amazing thing. So for those people that are telling you that there's not a move of God in the earth right now, do not believe that. When we pulled up to the Spirit uh, Bank Event Center, there was over a thousand people standing outside trying to get into the building. They were uh, over 20 countries represented there last night. Every state in our nation was represented there last night. And there was not a person in the building um, that was not hungry for Jesus. It was amazing. And I was amazed that when Michael asked how many people had never been to Tulsa, Oklahoma, that 90% of those people had never been to Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was a genuine, authentic move of God. And I was amazed that 80% of those people were 30 years old and younger. It was the most incredible thing. So for those of you who have heard the report that there's not a move of God in this nation, do not listen to it because we were right in the middle of it last night. Come on, you ought to give God praise right now because I believe something is happening. The winds of revival are blowing. I'm gonna say it again. The winds of revival are blowing in this nation. Are y'all believing God for revival like hundreds of people getting saved? Entire families, entire households born again? If you're believing God for that in this region, in this community, would you jump on your feet and give God a praise like you already saw it, like it's already happening, like it's already here. Shout as loud as you can. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Amen. I do. I believe it. Let's remain standing. We've been in this series. Real quick, before I read our text, one quick reminder, please. Um, if you know pastors in this area, Oklahoma City, Moore, Norman, just anywhere in this area uh, that you think would be interested in our conference, we're doing a roundtable uh, meeting with local pastors next week. And please email crystal at Quest Church. Uh, I think it's, I don't see any of my staff here. Right now. Yeah, Jamie, what is it? Crystal at QuestChurch.com or Crystal, yeah. So, so email her. And just give her those names uh, so that we can email those pastors and get them involved. Amen? Amen. The, our conference is not about us. We learned that last year, didn't we? We're just the host. So that means everyone in here is on the volunteer team. Right? Because we're, we're hosting the people coming in. And I can tell you, they're coming from all over the nation. So we need to be prepared to receive them. Smiles on our face hospitable in our hearts, welcoming people to receive the word of the Lord from these incredible men of God that are coming and women of God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, please. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must, say that word, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He is a what? Rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word. And I ask you for grace tonight. I ask you to help me tonight. Help me to say things that I did not study to say. I ask you to do something spontaneous among us tonight, something that's not on the agenda, something we didn't plan for it to happen. Hallelujah. 
We ask you to do that thing that you call exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. Do that kind of work in this building tonight. In Jesus' name. Let's clap our hands to Jesus one more time before you. Come on, y'all. That's pretty good. But let's get enthusiastic about our salvation. Amen. I know you've already done it, but high five your neighbor one more time and tell him it's on in the building right now. Amen. So I'm going to give you five. I'm going to give you five power principles concerning faith tonight. Are you ready for them? Five power principles concerning faith. So as we've been talking about faith, and it seems as though every preacher that I'm listening to in America is talking about faith, faith is always a precursor message to a major move. Okay? Faith is always a precursor message to a major move of God. So when you start hearing messages come from the four corners of the nation about faith, get ready. Because something explosive is about to transpire. My objective is clear. I am here to build your faith. I am here to help you increase your faith. I am here to help you move your prayer life from mediocrity to urgency. And start believing God for the biggest things you've ever prayed about in your entire life. Somebody shout, get ready, big is on the way. Amen. Nudge your neighbor and ask him, do you believe it? Do you believe it? So number one, here we go. We're going to start now, okay? Is this cool? Faith, number one, faith is what pleases God. Faith is what pleases God. God is not looking to be appeased. God is looking to be pleased. Are you with me? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So faith is what pleases God. The word please here in the Greek means to be, it's very simple, to be agreeable. How many of you know it is displeasurable to be disagreeable? Agreement changes the atmosphere. Agreement in the home produces an atmosphere of peace. Am I right? Disagreement in a home caused, causes turbulence in the atmosphere and tension in the atmosphere of a house. But where there is agreement, there's a feeling of peace and it is pleasurable. Are y'all with me? So without faith, it is impossible to be agreeable with God. Go ahead on with it. Without faith, it is impossible to come into agreement with God. And I wrote this and I read it Sunday. I'm going to read it again to appease him because a lot of people serve God out of trying to appease him or placate him or pacify him. It's as if you're trying to earn your salvation that was already paid for, right? So if you're trying to appease him, then your perspective of him is that he is very austere, that he's disturbed with you at all times. Whew. I want you to know you serve an everlasting father. You serve the mighty God. You serve the prince of peace. Stop trying to bring him into your perspective of him being peaceful with you. He's already at peace. If there's any turbulence in the relationship at all, it's your own personal inner conflict. God loves you unconditionally. And we used to say back in the day, right? He loves you just like you are, but too much to let you stay that way. Right? He loves you. And you must understand that you cannot do anything to appease him because he does not need to be appeased. He just wants to operate in a pleasurable relationship with his children. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Is this all right with you? 
That's why when Jesus is baptized, heaven opens up. And the voice of the Father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I said it Sunday, I'm going to say it one more time because I think it's an important reminder. That all of us are on a search for significance. We just want to feel significant. To feel significant, you first of all must feel accepted. And if you do not see God as merciful and forgiving and gracious toward you, you will always be trying to perform to get his applause. You will never perform your way into heaven. You will never perform your way into his pleasure. The fact that you are his son or daughter solidifies right now you are significant. As a matter of fact, you ought to bump your neighbor and just tell him, I am a significant something or another. That's what I am. <laughs> so faith pleases God. Now, I'm not trying to be trite, but I'm going to ask you a question. What pleases God? It's not a trick. What pleases God? Faith. It's real simple. Now, when you know you are operating in the pleasurable mode of serving God, suddenly confidence enters into your life because you know you have his endorsement. You know you have his approval. And when you have the Father's approval, it seems like nothing is impossible for you because you got back up. When I'm studying this today, I looked at Numbers chapter 14, verse 5. And listen to this. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly that was gathered there. And Joshua and Caleb who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we pat, you know, right now they're already frustrated, right? Because everybody says we ain't got no business trying to possess that. And they say it is ours. I love it when the minority says it's mine. I love it when just two people say, we can take this land, while you got uh, thousands of people saying it's impossible to do, to do. And all God needs is two guys saying, we're going to get what belongs to us. How many of you know faith is contagious just like fear is contagious? Faith and fear are both doing the same thing. They are attracting things to them. What you fear the most is coming toward you. Y'all better hear that. Job said, the thing I feared the most came upon me. But what you faith the most is also coming toward you. So we cast out fear tonight and we replace it with faith. Can you say amen to that? So Joshua and Caleb, they got upset with these people saying they can't do it. And watch what they said. The land we pass through is exceedingly good. Whew. Now watch what they say. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He will give it to us. We only have one question, guys. It's not your disagreement. It's is God pleased with us? Because if he is pleased with us, this promised land is absolutely our possession. The King James Version reads it like this. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us. If he delights in us, he will bring us. Delight means to take pleasure in. If he takes pleasure in us, then we can have every promise. You know why people do not pray in faith? Because they're not sure they're pleasing God. When you're not sure you're in agreement with God, it's hard to ask God for things. It's hard to believe him for the supernatural when you feel like he's not happy with you. Woo! But when you know you got your daddy's favor, when you know you got your daddy's pleasure, when you know he's delighting in you, then you'll look at Goliath and any other mountain and all giants and say, bring it on. 
because this is not just me warring against you. My father says you shall be defeated. So it gives you an immense amount of confidence. And you start praying differently when you know God is pleased with you. Am I helping anybody so far? So look at 1 John 3, 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Woo! I'm convinced of this. When people are not living in right relationship with God, they have trouble praying right. You don't ask in faith, you ask in wondering. Maybe, God, would you think about it? But when you know you're in right relationship with him, you're walking in agreement with him, then you can pray like this. Whatever you ask, you will receive. I remember Dustin. He was in the sixth grade. And he came home one day and he wanted a dog. And I was not interested in buying a dog, but he wanted a dog. And he came home and he was so smart. Instead of just asking me for the dog, he showed me his report card. <laughs> he said, Dad, I've got straight A's. He didn't even mention the dog. And I said, man, that is incredible. He goes, aren't you proud of me? I said, you got to know Dustin. I said, Dustin, I am extremely proud of you. He said, I know, Dad, I'm doing so good, and I'm working so hard in school. <laughs> right, Josh? Josh and John are sitting here. They know Dustin better than anyone. And, and he's going, I've worked so hard. Are you happy? I said, dude, I am so happy. He said, can I have a dog? <laughs> but I was so happy, I told him. I, I said, because I'm so thrilled with you, Dustin, you could ask for a Corvette, but you asked for a dog. <laughs> so we're going to get you a dog. You understand what I'm saying? But I was so pleased with him. And you've got to see that about your father. You've got to see that about God. God does not look at you. You come in and he's ready to spank you. When you walk in, he's ready to hug you. He wants to ask you, how was your day today? How did it go? And I'm so pleased with you. Go ahead and ask me for something. And I want to encourage you. Some of you have stopped asking God. Start asking again. And you stopped asking because you're not sure he's pleased with you. His love is unconditional for you. Nothing can separate you from the love of the Father. Things present or things to come. There's no demon, no principality that can separate you from the love of the Father. Would you give him praise right now because he takes pleasure in his children? Amen. So number one, faith does what? Pleases God. Here's number two. Faith has its own reward. In other words, faith produces rewards in our life like nothing else does. I don't know if you just heard that. But faith produces rewards in our life like nothing else does. Look at what it says. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he exists. Not that he was or he will be, but that he is right now the great I am. Not I was, not I will, I am. You must believe he is the I am. Woo, I'm helping myself tonight. So you must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now let me tell all the sanctified special people here tonight that think, you know, a lot of us have mindsets that, you know what, I don't want anything from God because God has just been good enough to me that I don't want anything. Well, God bless you. I'll take mine and yours. Because I'm not in this for nothing. 
Y'all didn't hear that right there. I'm not in this thing for nothing. I'm in it for something. What something? The something God promised me I can enjoy. I didn't write this in the Bible. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. The Greek word is remunerator, which means to give for services rendered. He rewards your faith. 2 John 8 says, watch out that you do not lose what you've worked for, but that you may be what? Rewarded fully. Jesus said, what you're going to receive as promises is not laid up just in heaven. But you're going to receive stuff right here on this earth. Man, listen, when I'm studying about this faith the last few weeks, I've been thinking, God, I'm expecting you to do stuff that's going to just shock me. I'm expecting resources to show up, new relationships to take me to the next level of living because I believe your word and your word says you're a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. And one thing I'm confident about, I have been diligent about seeking you. So I'll wake up every day expecting some spontaneous surprise from God. So the reward is a payment of contract that has been agreed on. There's the word again. If you don't come into agreement that God wants to reward you, guess what? Your reward's going to go right by you because you was never looking for it. Psalm 58 verse 11 says, Verily there is a reward for the righteous hallelujah some of you have been through stuff and you stay diligent to God some of you face some pain and some obstacles but you stayed faithful to serving God can I tell you tonight be encouraged God is about to reward you for the services rendered God is about to put a blessing on you that there's not room enough to receive it if you believe that would you give him praise one more time tonight God is a rewarder would you shout it as loud as you can? God is a rewarder. Say it again. Come on. God is a rewarder. It's not an award. It's not an award. It's a reward. There's a whole lot of difference. An award is something like a trophy. But a reward has some continuity to it. It has some perpetuity to it. It's perpetual. It lasts a while. And God is about to reward you with something that's going to linger. Not something you're going to put on the shelf and look at it like a sixth grade football player. <laughs> if you believe it, shout it. My reward is coming. My reward is coming. Some of y'all are going to get that. Amen. Number three. Number one is what? Faith is what? Faith pleases God. Number two is what? Faith has its own reward. Number three, faith is what it takes to stand. Faith is what it takes to stand. Paul wrote Ephesus and said, after you've done all to stand, stand therefore. Amen? Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance. And we talked about this on Sunday, and we'll slow it down a little bit tonight. Say the word substance. The word substance has evolved over time. It has always been related to something that sounds substance, something sound and solid. But I learned something today. It's, it comes from a Latin root word that means to stand firm. Faith is standing firm. Faith is saying, I put my life on it. Faith is saying, I guarantee you. Amen. You remember when you used to serve God with such fervor and fire? That you just woke up like you were so excited that you were standing firm on your faith. Your faith was not a wavering faith. It was not a double-minded faith. No one could talk you out of your faith. The opposite of the word substance, I wrote this today, is the word immaterial. Immaterial is something that does not matter. 
I hope y'all don't miss this here. The opposite of faith is immaterial. Immaterial is something that doesn't matter or which adds nothing of value to the subject at hand. Immaterial adds nothing to the subject. <laughs> faith has to matter. Substance is the matter. Faith is not immaterial. Faith is the material. So faith has to matter. If what you were believing for does not matter or adds nothing to your purpose, then why have faith for it? Should I say that again? I think I shall. If what you are believing for does not matter or adds nothing to your purpose, then why have faith for it? Some of the things we've prayed for did not show up because even though you thought it mattered, God knew it did not. It mattered to you, but it did not matter to him. And he knew if you received what mattered to you, which was immaterial to him, then the matter you've been praying for showing up in your life had the potential to destroy you. So stop fussing over stuff that does not matter to God's will in your life. That is the reason you have unanswered prayers. Because it does not matter. It's immaterial. You put so much value on it. And God's saying it will devalue your life if it shows up. So. It must matter. Faith help, uh, helps us to focus on things that matter. Faith will stop you from praying ambiguous prayers. Faith will stop you from just wandering in your relationship with the Lord. Faith will focus your prayer life on things that really count. Hmm. Are y'all with that so far? Amen. If it's not in your life, then God said it does not matter. If you prayed about it and had faith for it and it mattered, guess what's going to happen? It's going to show up because it's the substance. You don't need the kind of substance that's going to be strange to your destiny. Talk in the building, Pastor Rick. Why live in mystery when you can live in what matters? Yeah. Praise God. Faith is substance. We talked about this Sunday. That which stands under. It is your understanding. It's your understanding. It's that which you stand on. You can't build a life without understanding. The greatest enemy to your substance is circumstance. The greatest enemy to your understanding is misunderstanding. Is this too deep for y'all? I hope not, because I love this kind of stuff. This is all new to me, too, so this isn't something I pulled out of a book or preached 5,000 times. This stuff is new. I hope you appreciate that. Good. All right, good. So circumstance comes from the words outskirts or to stand around. It actually comes from two words, to stand and stare. So the enemy will shove circumstances in your life that will just look at you and see if you're going to change your substance. He will send things that are immaterial, that do not matter, to get your focus off of what really matters. Does it really matter that she don't like you anymore? Does it really matter that that didn't work out? We make mountains out of molehills. 
I wrote this today. Circumstances do not make me what I am. They reveal what I have chosen to believe. Say it one more again, Pastor Rick. Circumstances do not make me what I am. But they reveal what I have chosen to believe. Never allow your circumstance to change or alter your substance. Your substance has to be stronger than your circumstance. What matters has to be more convicting than what does not matter. You know what does not matter? People's opinion of you. You know what does not matter? Gossip doesn't matter. It don't matter. What matters is the gospel. What matters is that you're serving God. Yes. Circumstance, stand and stare. Charles Spurgeon said these words. If we cannot believe God when circumstances seem to be against us, we do not believe God at all. Circumstances will always do their job. <laughs> you will never have to worry about circumstances showing up and not doing their job. They're going to show up. And they're going to look at you and they're going to stare you down to see if you're going to move off of what you really believe. Hallelujah. Do this with me. Take your hand, put it in the air, and do this here. And say, all my circumstances have to submit to my substance. What's standing around me has to submit to what's working inside of me. Now give God a praise right there. Amen. Give God a praise. Amen. Greater is he than is in you than he that's in the world. I want to take this to level two. Is that all right? This circumstance thing. Second Kings 6 verse 15. Let me explain to you what's happened. The king of Aram is at war with the king of Israel. The king of Israel has a secret weapon. And the secret weapon is a prophet named Elisha. Elisha is so in tune with God that he's telling the king of Israel the very thing the king of Aram was talking about in his bedroom. And he was telling his servants, go and tell the king of Israel, this is what he was talking about in his bedroom. Now, you know you got a prophet among you when he's been in your bedroom. I saw what you did last night. Well, it makes the king of Aram furious. So he says, where is this prophet? And they said, he's in Dothan. So they sent, he sent servants with a messenger to intimidate him or to threaten him. Now watch what happens. In 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 15, the servant of Elisha got up and went out early in the morning and there was an army with horses and chariots around, surrounding the city. Oh no. I would have said it like this, oh my God. But he said, oh no, my Lord. I would have said, oh my God. What we going to do? He said, what shall we do? <laughs> I would have run in there and said, oh my God, what we going to do? <laughs> when I get in trouble, my proper English leaves very quickly. <laughs> he said, what we going to do? Look at verse 16. The prophet said, the first thing you're going to do is get rid of fear. Do not be afraid of your circumstance. Do not be afraid of what's standing around looking at us. Are y'all hearing me in this building tonight? Tell your neighbor, don't be afraid of what you see. Woo. Watch what he said. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And he prayed, and this was my prayer for you today at about 1.30, Lord, open their eyes so that they may see 
Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. Yes, yeah, circumstances were surrounding them, but God had substance surrounding the circumstance. You have messed with the wrong people. You have surrounded the wrong family. You have surrounded the wrong prophet. You have surrounded the wrong person. And I'm praying that God opens your eyes tonight. The opening of your eyes is understanding. I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That's what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. This is what Elisha prayed. Open their eyes to let them see the substance is greater than the circumstance. What is surrounding them is surrounded by God. If you believe that tonight, somebody give him praise like God's got you surrounded. Amen. He's got you. Amen. Nudge your neighbor and tell them, open your eyes and see it. Amen. Let me finish this up. I'm on number four. I'm on number four. Woo, man. Number four, faith is the proof of your pro profession. Faith is the proof of your profession. Confession is the telling of. Profession is the telling for. When you profess something, you're saying something for something. When you confess something, you're admitting something. Hold fast to your profession of faith is what Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews. Hold fast to your what? Profession. You ever met anybody that said they was a professional? And then they showed up to do the work and they left and you realized they was an amateur. Kenny's pointing at Richard right now, but I ain't gonna say nothing about that. But they showed up as a professional, but the work was done and you looked at it and you said, that's not professional, that's an amateur. There's a lot of people <laughs> that they act like they have something that they really don't have. Yeah. Faith is the proof of your profession. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, but it is the what? Say it again, Elder Carey. It's the proof of things not seen. Evidence is the deciding factor in a trial. Trials are won by the evidence, by the proof. 1 Peter 1, you rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through the manifold temptations you're facing. But why is it happening? That the trial of your faith, the what? So everybody say this with me. Faith on trial. You can't claim a faith that you're not willing to try. Faith is not a fantasy. Faith is the real deal. And if faith is the real deal, then you must be willing to take it to trial. Evidence is proof or conviction. We do not know if you have the proof until you face a problem. Go ahead, Pastor Rick. We don't know if you have the proof till you face a problem. We do not know if you have the faith until you face the fire. We do not know if you have a conviction until you face a contradiction to what you believe. So we really don't know if you have faith it until the trial shows up. A lot of people run around here talking about they got faith. Well, let me see what you do when hell shows up at your house. Hebrews eleven seventeen says, by faith, Abraham, when he was what? Tried. I thought it was on the screen. There it is. By faith, Abraham, when he was what? Say it. Tried. Offered up Isaac. 
And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Sound familiar? Of whom it was said that in Isaac your seed shall be called. Verse 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. And which also he received him in a figure. Remember the other day when I told you substance also means image. It's the image of a thing. The image is an Isaac, Isaac representing Jesus. That even as God raised Jesus from the dead, Abraham had enough faith to believe, even if I sacrifice him, he's going to raise from the dead, and me and him who walked up this mountain going to walk down this mountain too. Are y'all hearing this tonight? That's faith. Faith is saying, I am so obedient that God, I will take my faith to trial. Because if you put it on trial, something is about to be resurrected. Something is about to miraculously happen in my life. Some of you have been in the most trying time of your life. And I'm here to build your faith, to tell you to hold on. As I said Sunday, I'm going to say one more time tonight. You coming up this side of the trial, but your promise is coming up the other side of the trial. There's a ram taking every step that you take. You're just being tried. And if you're being tested, if you pass this test, what does that mean? You go to the next level of living. You are promoted to another phase of life. So don't lose your faith in this room while there's a great room on the other side of what you're going. Come on, y'all, praise him tonight. There's another place that's bigger than where you are, but you can't lose faith now. Shout it as loud as you can three times. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Tell your neighbor, hold on, brother. Hold on, sister. It's just a trial. It's just a test. And when you pass this, somebody shouted, I'm going to the next level. And when I get there, I'm going to be tried again. But when I'm tried again, I'm going to a higher Now break off with a praise and worship him tonight. He loves you like that. Finally, Woo. tell your neighbor, here come number five right now. This is the last one. Let's go through them. Y'all tell me. Number one is what? Faith pleases God. Number two, faith has its own reward. Number three, faith is what it takes to stand. Number four, faith is the proof of your profession. And finally, Faith requires sound. Throw your head back, open your mouth and shout, turn up the volume. Some of y'all are saying, please don't do that, Pastor Rick. Shout it again, turn up the volume. Faith requires sound. He, Hebrews 1.3, he is the express image of his father. The same word as substance. He's the express substance of the father. If you've seen the son, you've seen the father. I and my father are one. So they would should say about you, if I've seen you, I've seen Jesus. Image. The exact image of what you've asked for. Watch what it says. The exact image or the substance holds all things by the word of his power. If you've got the substance without the sound, you can't hold anything up. But if your substance matches your sound, nothing can take you down. Word is rhema. He upholds it by the word. Any sound produced by the voice that has definite meaning, which means you can't pray ambiguously. 
Imaging is creating a picture or visual, visualization. I told you about sonogram. It's a sound that creates a picture. Now, I want to talk to you guys. Sound does what? Creates a picture. You can have somebody sing in here a Stevie Wonder song. I didn't say it was anointed or written by the Holy Ghost. I said Stevie Blind Wonder <laughs> can sing in this building and move your emotions to the point that you will cry. Well, at least me, maybe not you. You know, maybe it might be Kenny Rogers or somebody. I don't know who it is. But whoever it is, surely uh, Brian, uh, what's his name? Brian McKnight. I mean, every woman in the building knows Brian McKnight going to say amen right now, but I know y'all don't know who that is. But he's a crooner. You got to learn to loop them crooners. <laughs> I, 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 I'll stop. I'll leave it alone. Anyway, so the sound produces a picture. The song starts drawing a picture, painting a picture. It creates feelings. That's why I want to tell you something tonight. If imaging, imaging, same word as substance, right, in the Greek, produces pictures, then why would we have quiet praise? We ain't painting nothing. Y'all ain't hearing me. When you sing in songs like, how great is our God. When you sing these songs of praise, you're making him huge. That's why the psalm says, oh, magnify. This is a song. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Don't let me paint this picture by myself. Because if we get it sounding right in the room, we're going to paint a picture of God that's so big. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. I worry about a church with no sound. I worry about a church that ain't saying nothing. Jesus said, say to the mountain, be removed and be, say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and be cast in. You got to say something. Sound produces faith. I dare you to throw your head back and let a sound emit out of you. Let's let sound go up in this room. Let's, let's, how many scriptures are there that say make a joyful noise? Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Over and over, there was a sound of a going in the top of the mulberry trees. Suddenly there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. There's only one scripture I can think of that says be still and know, but it never says be silent. It says be still and know that I am God. I can be still and shout at the same time. Are y'all in the building? Walls don't come down until shouts come out. Walls of Jericho are waiting for one thing, the sound of faith. When we shout, the walls come down. I, I, I really believe that the Holy Ghost is putting a sonogram on churches. I really do. It's like I saw the Holy Ghost running a sonogram over sanctuaries. And he's looking for visualization. He's looking for imaging. He's looking for sound that produces a picture. Because if you see it, if you see it, you can have it. But sound produces the picture. I dare you to throw both your hands up and begin to praise him with your voice. Come on, make him big in this building tonight. Make him strong with your praise tonight. You serve a mighty God. You serve a God that can do anything. His name is Jehovah Jireh. He supplies all your need. His name is Jehovah Shalom. He is a God of peace. His name is Jehovah Sitkanu. Are you in the building? Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. See him today. See God is majestic. See him strong and mighty. 
See his right arm extended. See God fighting your battle. Jehoshaphat, the prophet comes to Jehoshaphat and he tells him, Jehoshaphat said, we don't know what to do. The prophet said, I'll tell you what to do. Make noise. He said, what do you mean? He said, all you got to do is sing that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end because when you begin to sound, he said, you're not going to have to fight. Just make noise. You're not going to have to struggle. Just make sound. You know what amazes me? People that go to other churches and come back and tell me how incredible their praise is and how loud it is and how intense it is. But when you get in here, you don't lift your voice. Don't tell me about other churches and how great they praise God when you stand in a building with your arms crossed and you're like, you helping the atmosphere? No. Jesus said, if you don't open your mouth and praise me, the stones will cry out in your place. He needs sound in order to move. He needs noise in order to operate. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Come on, everybody, throw those hands up. Shout to God with a voice of triumph tonight. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. Come on, everybody, make enough noise tonight to start drawing a picture of how great your God is. Hallelujah. Faith requires sound. Faith requires sound. Say to the mountain. Perfect in all of your ways. Yes, God, you're perfect. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect. You are 